May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So here we are on this third Sunday of the Easter season. And with the stories broken up over these Sundays, it's easy to forget just how quickly the events following Jesus' resurrection occur. In the morning of that first day of the week, the women find the empty tomb. And then in the Gospel of Luke, on that same day, Jesus walks and talks and breaks bread with two disciples on the road, leaving town on their way to Emmaus. And then they recognize Jesus and the breaking of that bread, and they immediately run back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples. And that is where our story this morning picks up. And actually, the first sentence of our story begins with, while the disciples were talking about this, this being the encounter on the road to Emmaus, while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. No offense, but who wouldn't be? I know I would have probably the same reaction. And Jesus asks them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Again, I cannot imagine not being frightened. These disciples are hunkered down afraid that the authorities will be coming after them. They're trying to sort through the strange reports of those who have encountered a risen Jesus. The women at the tomb, these two on the road to Emmaus. And in the midst of all of this, Jesus suddenly appears among them. And Jesus responds to their fear first with the words, peace be with you. But then he challenges their fear, challenges their fear with the questions, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Jesus meets them where they are, but he does not leave them there. He invites them to touch and see his wounds. He eats some fish to prove to them that he is not a ghost. And in this, he is encouraging them to move beyond where they are, beyond their fear. We are told while in their joy, They were disbelieving and still wondering. They are still trying to make sense of this all. And Jesus opens their minds to understand the prophecies of scripture, to see that though death is real, life is stronger. However, the Jesus who died on the cross and had been raised did not come back simply to take up his old job. He commissions the disciples to become witnesses. In both last week's story from the Gospel of John and this week's story from Luke, Jesus greets the disciples with peace be with you. He invites them to touch his wounds. He shows them that he is not a ghost. And again, he calls them to go out and to witness to these things. As we know that even in the transformation of Jesus' body through the resurrection, 
he still retains his wounds. In the resurrection, Jesus is made new, but his wounds remain. And the older I get, I realize how much my wounds remain a part of who I am. How much the ways we heal or don't heal. How much the ways we heal or don't heal from our wounds. How much that all plays a significant part in who we are and how we relate. How we relate to others, relate to our own selves, relate to our God and how this shapes us as human beings. Any of us who has ever broken an arm or a finger or a hip or any other part can attest to the healing which occurs once everything has been reset. But that arm or finger or hip is never exactly the same again either. And so it is, especially with a heart, a heart which has been broken. But we go on, even if at times it is just putting one foot in front of the other. Kevin Kling, a writer, playwright, a storyteller, speaks about his near-death experience in a motorcycle accident. He was hit by a car and thrown from his motorcycle, and upon his body's impact with the pavement, he experienced this tremendous sense of peace. And he knew he had a choice. He could either stay with that beautiful peace, or he could return to tension. And for some reason, even unknown to him, <clears throat> he chose to return to tension. And he went through months of intense pain and depression and rehab. But in spite of all of this, or because of all of this, he says he learned a few very important lessons that changed his whole way of living. First, he realized that he no longer feared death since he had experienced a taste of that peace. But the other lesson took a bit longer to realize. In his depression while he was in rehab, he had no desire to eat. Food had no taste. And his wife, Mary, kept trying to get him to eat. And one day, as they were working on his walking outside on the street, he finally gave in to her request for him to try just one bite of an apple. And as he bit into that apple, he says the sweetness of it just exploded in his mouth. And he began to cry, something he says he hadn't done in years. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Wynne, for that affirmation. <laughs> and with the mixture, the mixture of the sweetness of the apple and the saltiness of his tears, he experienced this overwhelming sense of gratitude. Dear God, he said, thank you, thank you, thank you that I am alive. And the pieces of his body and his life had been put back together, but not exactly as they had been before his accident. And what I didn't mention at the beginning 
was that Kevin was born with his left arm much, much shorter than his right arm and not fully developed. And in the motorcycle accident, his healthy right arm became completely, permanently paralyzed. Ever since that experience years ago, that experience of the simple sweetness of an apple, ever since then he has felt tremendous gratitude for anything and everything. As he says, he has been able to find blessings in each of his curses. He has found life, life with its saltiness and sweetness. And so I wonder about the disciples receiving this peace from Jesus, this peace that comes from witnessing firsthand the experience of death and then life out of death. Experiencing that peace that comes from no longer feeling, fearing failure. Peace that comes from realizing our imperfections, our wounds, are part of what makes us who we are. And I wonder what Jesus thought and experienced when he bit into that first bite of broiled fish. Peace and tension are both very much a part of our living on this earth. We long for peace among the nations, peace among our communities, perhaps even peace within our families. And yet there is always the tension within all of life. And that is a very real part of our living and relating. How do we find or create balance so that relationships are not so out of whack that they are harmful, that they are destructive? Last week in the midst of Eid, a most holy time for our Muslim sisters and brothers, a time which should have been marked with joy, the Islamic center at Rutgers was horribly vandalized. And we reach out to our Muslim sisters and brothers in support. And in the midst of the destruction and devastation in Gaza and the Middle East, a colleague of mine participated last week in an interfaith iftar in Jerusalem with Muslims, Jews, and Christians who are all very intentionally seeking to share a meal, to find common ground together through their religion. Breaking fast under the shadow of war, trying to work towards peace through that common ground, trying to recognize the holy in our midst. Jesus meets us where we are, perhaps hunkered down in fear and doubt behind locked doors. But Jesus also calls us and challenges us to move beyond where we are in our relationship with him, with our God, with each other. And he sends us out with our doubts, with our imperfections, with our wounds to witness, to witness to the new life which comes out of brokenness, to witness to the holy which breaks into our daily lives and stands among us. May the peace of God which passes all understanding, be with us all. Amen. Amen.